Hors and gents, welcome to your reaction. This is why 50% of Indians live north of this line. But I'm real life lore. Okay, I knew about USA. I knew about Canada too, I guess somewhat. But India? I'm an Indian. I live in India. This is this is gonna be surprising to me. I don't know which line he's gonna talk about. Could be south. North is probably very mountainous. I don't know. Hell, even Middle East, lots of mountainous. I don't know. I don't know what's going to be. I don't know which line it is. But I'll be surprised if it's not south. But yeah. All right. Well, let's watch this one. Remember, we'll flag my reaction. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. And yeah, let's watch it. For thousands of years, India has remained the world's second most populous country behind China. But in a matter of only a few more months, that historical reality will change forever. At some point in 2023, the Indian population will finally overtake the Chinese with more than 1.4 billion people and from then on throughout the rest of the 21st century and beyond, India will likely continue to remain the new world's most populous nation. And it has been a long time coming. As recently as 70 years ago, back in 1950, yeah. China's population of 552 Doesn't million was still significantly larger than India's 359 million. But over the seven plus decades of history that have followed since then, India's population grew by a whopping 390%. Wow. By the way, this is more like a old center bazaar type of area of the city, if this is a city. It could be, you know, village town area. But if this is a city, that's more like old city type of area, small area. So this is not how city looks, basically. While China's only grew by 255%. And while China's population is beginning to stagnate and decrease, India's is still growing. By the midpoint mm. of the century in 2050, the United Nations projects that China will lose around 30 million people from their population a day. Lose? I guess I knew about that, right? I'm pretty sure I saw a video about it. But yeah, India's is going to keep growing. That's not something we're proud of. But yeah, after seeing that clip just now, you saw how many people are walking there, right? And that's not an exaggeration, right? Like I said, one of the old town, old bazaar type of area, it's really, you know, really crowded like that. I don't go to areas like that. Because if you see that, right, you as a foreigner see that, and just like, holy shit, I can't even imagine walking there. Yeah, I'm also the same. <laughs> Lots of people in India cannot imagine walking places like that. So yeah, it's too crowded, it's just too much. Hey, well, India will add another 200 million Damn. more. Nearly an entire Brazil's worth of additional people in less than 30 years. But the oh. massive explosion in India's population over the past several decades has not been even across the whole country. And India's continued growth across the 21st century will not be even either. In fact, the majority of the states within India already have fertility rates, the amount of children born per woman, that are lower. Oh, that's surprising. Okay, I live in Gujarat, by the way. Huh. Oh my god, it's gonna be north, right? 50% of Indian lives north of this line or something? I didn't see that coming. Then the natural population replacement level of 2.1. This means that the birth rate across most of India is actually already more comparable to countries in the West and elsewhere who are experiencing natural population decline, like mm. Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom. The only states in India that are still growing their populations, and the states that will add the vast majority of those additional 200 million Indians by 2050, are all up in the north Bihar, of the country I mean, in these states. Kind of makes sense. Bihar, Meghalaya, Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh literally mean north state or something. Pradesh just mean, you know, I guess area or something, state, you can call it state. Uttar means north. So Madhya Pradesh means middle state or something, because it's in the middle. Jharkhand and Manipur. And perhaps unsurprisingly, these are the same general areas that have been leading the majority of India's population growth now for decades. Damn. If you draw a line across India up here in the north, you will discover a startling population imbalance within the country. Nearly half of India's population of about 1.4 billion people live to the north of this line, across just a relative sliver of the country's total area, while the other half, of course, live beneath it across the majority of India's landmass. This line of population distribution within India India can come as a shock to many Americans and people in the West who are unfamiliar with India. And because the majority in India. of India's largest <laughs> mega cities that most Westerners have heard of are actually beneath this line in the South. Uh. Of the top five largest cities in India, four of them are beneath this line. And of the top ten. Let's be honest, Delhi, Delhi barely made it, otherwise, it would have been south of the line too. So, Okay, first of all, anybody who hears of India, there's a high chance, 90% chance, they're basically, whatever they saw is probably from Mumbai. That's the only place that is really famous. 
so all those slum dog millionaire whatever photos right those slums you see daravi basically one of the densest thing in the world right place that all comes from mumbai right so uh, you know north of that line india is very diverse right people say india is a big and diverse place they they're not they, you know they're not just saying that as a thing you say for any country india is way too big there's a you know the way too diverse even with terrain if you go to somewhere like bihar or something like this so in the north and somewhere in you know south like tamil nadu right there's going to be massive differences there right i mean you could say same thing about other countries like us or something but those are land wise very big countries there are literal time zone differences there that's not the case with india right india is not small but it's not as big as usa and having too much differences i mean whenever people think of india they just think of those slums and everything about mumbai and things but that's not everything that is right and seven of them are beneath it including the largest and the most densely populated city in india of all mumbai mm. the sheer scale of mumbai's population is difficult for a lot of people to understand so let me try and put it this way mumbai is a coastal city and located across an island called south set This island is only 619 square kilometers in size, which is smaller than Singapore, and yet it is home to more than 20 million people, which is greater than the entire population of Kazakhstan, the world's ninth biggest country. To put it another way, all of the boroughs of New York City combined, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx, add up to 784 square kilometers, which is 42% more land than South Said Island where Mumbai is located, and yet New York City's population is less than 8 and a half million people. South Said Island therefore has about the same population density as Manhattan, but across an area that is 10 times the size Dali. of Manhattan, including this place called Dravi. This location <laughs> within Mumbai is considered to be one of the largest slums in the world and not because of its area. I won't call dead being in that place simply because I'm afraid of it. I don't know why like I said, like I don't go into densely packed areas, right? I mean, I'm not afraid of people. I'm just afraid of that level of denseness. I don't know why just that kind of a rush you know i don't know how to say it you know that kind of a rush type of place with that many dense people you know just tugging pushing everybody just i, I can't do that shit so i'm just scared just seeing this The whole place is only about 2 square kilometers in size, or about 3/5 of Central Park in the middle of Manhattan. And yet, there are about 1 million people who live crowded within here. Barely making any it one of the most densely populated places anywhere on the planet. And yet, insanely crowded Dravi within Mumbai on South Said Island is still south of the population line within the area where the minority of Indians overall live. Yeah, but, look, that's it's one in place you can't really compare to the whole country look first of all i know the middle places are kind of mountainous i live in gujarat like i said and if i go you know i was doing uh, you know a thermal power plant i have a civil construction job like contract and it was in madhya pradesh right i used to travel like around what 200 300 miles or something yeah so I, i remember as soon as i leave gujarat i can see all the mountainous area and there's just mountainous everywhere right Right. as soon as i leave gujarat i can see that it's becoming less and less populated in a way right uh, as soon as i leave gujarat to i guess go to rajasthan in the north or south you know maharashtra mumbai side, i can see mountains just coming up gujarat is not that mountainous there are mountains but average is not mountainous but every everything around it is kind of is so that makes me think that because of mountainous areas it could be a problem living there while those no- northern area that i have that many populous and probably is kind of a flat livable areas i don't know and since it's very close to himalayas it could be weather thing too This fact makes more sense though when you look at India through the lens of population density where you can now clearly see the nearly unbroken chain of continuous clusters of people across Himalaya the north of India of a, above yeah. the line and only like as a Himalayas kind of like common thing see this patch goes to, yeah i guess Himalayas you know weather it could rain there a lot compared to the place i don't know scattered clusters of high population urban areas across the area south of the line including most of india's big mega cities like mumbai bangalore and hyderabad but mm. why is india's population pattern shaped this way with a massive amount of people living within the interior of the country up in the north and relatively fewer people living around the coasts and in the south a very yeah, big part of the explanation <laughs> is simply the indian subcontinent's geography and its influence on weather patterns 
patterns. And we'll begin here by swapping out the population density map for a topographic oh, map. Oh, there you go. I live as an in zone. See, there you go. This is where I live. And I live as it's like, you know, water level almost makes no difference. And then green, even this feels mountainous to me, right? So this kind of makes sense. See, this is again blue. Yeah. One of the biggest keys to the puzzle are simply the enormous arc of mountains to the north of the subcontinent, the Himalayas mm. and the Hindu Kush. These mountains are the tallest and the most formidable in the world and are among the youngest mountains as well. They were formed millions of years ago when the Indian tectonic plate first crashed into the Eurasian plate. Four millions, barely an infant. Come back to me when you reach billions. A geologic process that is still ongoing. Just as it has for tens of millions of years now, the Indian plate is still crashing northwards yeah. into the Eurasian plate at a pace of around 67 millimeters a year, which is contributing to the already towering mountains of the Himalayas growing even higher. Mount Everest, already the highest mountain in the world, is continuing to grow even higher at a pace of around 4 millimeters a year because of this ongoing process. In total, there are more than 100 different mountain peaks across the Himalayas that soar to more than 7,200 meters above sea level. And they all serve to create the most significant barrier across land anywhere on the planet. Most significantly for India, these towering mountains basically act like a wall, and they block nearly all of the frigid and dry polar winds that blow down from the north from Siberia across Central Asia. Mm. As a result, the land to the north of the mountains in Tibet is effectively a high, dry, and cold desert because there's nothing to stop all those winds until they hit the wall of the mountains. And because of these mountains, they cause the opposite climatic effects over to the south in India. Without any of the cold and dry winds blowing in from Central Asia, northern India is kept significantly warmer and wetter than it otherwise would be. And mm. consequently, the temperate zone extending across northern India is significantly warmer than any other temperate zone on the planet, especially during the winter months, which means that the growing... Okay, the reason is not the same as I thought, but mountains still play a role, so I was kind of right. I thought mountains kind of block the cloud you know the how it does in uh, i guess uh you know nevada and every you know not nevada washington state and everywhere i thought it was going to be something similar but no it blocks the you know i guess air coming from the you know north from you know sahara and everything to, so it doesn't get affected by you know desert things or something india should be desert right that scientifically india should be desert it's at that line because of monsoon season it's not and in this area, basically, it stays, you know, wet and, you know, warm. So, obviously, it's going to be really good for farming. The season for plants here is effectively year-round and longer than pretty much anywhere else. But then the other big thing that the towering Himalayas do for northern India and its population potential is significantly affect the area's monsoon winds and levels of precipitation. During the uh, summer months, also moist air evaporated from the <laughs> Indian Ocean will be pushed into the subcontinent. And when that moist air so reaches like. the mountains, <laughs> it will rise and cool but fail to climb high enough to reach over the mountains into Tibet. Which is another reason why Tibet is so dry and arid. Then, that cool and moist air will have nowhere left to go but back down from the mountain slopes and across the open plains of northern India and Bangladesh. Which often means yep. that the summer months between June and September will see an absolutely ungodly amount of rainfall here in an annual process known as the southwestern monsoon. But the vast plains of northern India don't get most of their water from rainfall. Instead, they get most of it from the rivers that also come down from the towering mountains up in the north. Yeah, it's it's June to September, that is what it should be. But recent years, it has become really chaotic. I guess global warming can be felt, right? Uh, you know, sometimes rain starts in July, you know, ends in a month or two. Sometimes rain started June, but doesn't even end all the way to October. Not continuously, but monsoon season, basically. You see, the mountains here store the third largest concentration of freshwater ice and snow in the world remaining only behind Antarctica and the Arctic Circle. Mm. As a result, the Himalayas alone contain an estimated 15,000 separate glaciers that collectively store somewhere around 12,000 cubic kilometers worth of freshwater, roughly equivalent to the entire volume of water found in Lake Superior within North America. So as a result of their height and their enormous volumes of water, three of the world's mightiest rivers all begin up here, and they all flow to the south through the plains of northern India, yep. Pakistan, and Bangladesh the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra rivers. And these rivers are what grant the wide open plains of the northern subcontinent their name, the Indo-Gangetic Plain, 
a stretch of nearly continuous flat, arable farmland that is larger than the entirety of France, and the second largest piece of contiguous arable land anywhere in the world, only behind the Great Mississippi Basin in the United States. Mm. And best of all, the Indus, Ganges, and Brahmaputra rivers, and all of their tributaries that flow through this huge plain, are all fed by the glaciers up in the Himalayas, which means that they maintain a continuous flow of water all throughout the year, and they aren't heavily dependent upon the erratic whims of the weather that brings the rain. And even better, the glacial melt into these rivers from the mountains blesses the rivers with an abundance of rich minerals and nutrients, mm. which means that whenever the rivers overflow into the region's floodplains, they distribute those nutrients into the soil and effectively function as a form of rich and powerful natural fertilizer. In short, a perfect combination of factors that creates the richest and the most highly fertile piece of farmland anywhere in the world that can grow a massive amount of food all throughout the year to support a lot of people. It's no surprise surprised then that when you compare a map of India's India. population density with a map of India's elevation, with a further map of India's agricultural productivity, you'll see that most of the agricultural productivity is up in the population belt of people across the flat plains of the north while much of the Indian interior to the south of the line is simply a lot less agriculturally productive and, consequently, has a lower population density. It's also a small- I think, uh, you know, population density has to be, has to do with more of a, you know, more, more southern areas like western southern areas right, where the major cities are. These areas are more developed in a way, right, more educated, you know, in south, the more south you go in India, Tamil Nadu, it's just you know more educated people right poverty rate is really low certain areas is ridiculous in that way you barely find any single beggar when you think of India you just think of like you know Mumbai type of thing everybody dance everybody just dance back everybody just bagging slumdog millionaire type of thing but when you go to south that's not going to be case a lot right so that could be one of the reason right like people you know are becoming more educated people are becoming more prosperous right more richer and they're just having less children, I guess. That's how it goes, right? Uh, you know, uh, more modernized people, get, you know, less children. That's how trend goes on. That could be one of the reason. Consequently, has a lower population density. It's also a small wonder then how the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh alone became home to more than 240 million people today greater than the entire population of Pakistan or Brazil, and all in an area that's no larger than the United Kingdom. Conversely, the southern portions of India beneath the population line don't have the same scale of advantages towards agriculture and population growth that's seen in the north. Much of the area beneath the line is dominated by a large geographic feature known as the Deccan Plateau, a largely arid, rocky, and hilly expanse of land with an average elevation of about 600 meters. And while the Himalayan mountain range greatly improves the north's ability to grow food, another mountain range down here across the south and the west inhibits this region's ability to do the same. The western Ghats here that extend across the westernmost fringe of the country. While they may not be as dominating as the Himalayas, the western Ghats are still a significant mountain range nonetheless, with many of their peaks over 2,000 meters in height, which are higher than the biggest mountain range found in Australia that separates that continent's narrow and wet eastern coastal plain from the dry outback desert of the interior. Mm. And in a similar fashion to those mountains in Australia, the western Ghats here in India generally cause the same kind of effect over the Deccan Plateau of the Indian interior. There's only a narrow coastal plain between them in the east and the Arabian Sea in the west, where winds blowing in from the ocean are actually capable of depositing their rainfall. But once those moist winds strike the western Ghats, they fail to climb over them and so the lands to their east across the Deccan Plateau are drier and more arid than they otherwise would be were the mountains not to exist. Mm. This is why when you look at a precipitation map of India, you can clearly see the effect that the western Ghats have, with abundant rainfall across across the narrow strip of a coastal plain in the west, and significantly less rainfall immediately beyond them in the interior where the Deccan Plateau is. And then to complement the continuous western Ghat Mountains, there is a similar mountain range across the east of India as well, the eastern Ghats. These aren't continuous and they're a little smaller than the mountains across western India, so they don't block as much moisture coming in from the Bay of Bengal, but they do serve to block some of it. 
So the Ooh. vast expanse of the Deccan Plateau in the interior is less flat and receives less rainfall than the plains of the north, which of course makes agriculture a more difficult practice here. But then there is the further disadvantage that the rivers across the south of India here are not fed by glaciers like they are in the north, and instead they're fed by rainfall. The biggest three rivers here to consider are the Godavari, Krishna, and Kaveri, all three mm. of which begin within the western Ghats mountain range and flow eastwards across the Deccan Plateau before emptying into the Bay of Bengal. But of course, the western Ghats are nowhere near as high as the Himalayas are, and they're located a lot further south where there aren't any cold winds blowing in from Siberia, so they don't have any glaciers. And that means that all of the rivers here are entirely fed by the rainfall blowing in from the Arabian Sea. But that means that they aren't as suitable for agriculture as the glacial-fed rivers up in the north like the Ganges and the Brahmaputra for yeah. two critical reasons. Huh. That is interesting. I mean, I knew about the guards, but I didn't, I didn't you know, piece it, piece it together like that. Like, it's not going to be suitable for that. So then it really makes pretty simple, right? I mean, that's like a, from the... Uh, you know, center of India to all the way to south. Look at that, that's a massive area that it covers. But whenever I see fucking south, south areas, uh, clips or something, the tea farms and whatever, right? Tea, you know, hills or whatever. It's always green. So what is that all about? If it's that bad. And I guess it's all in Tamil Nadu or something, all those clips. It's like the Ganges and the Brahmaputra for two critical reasons. One, they don't get the same kinds of minerals and nutrients as the glacial-fed rivers do, which means that when they flood, they don't deposit the same levels of nutrients. It doesn't rain for a while, the rivers have less water in them, and there's less mm. water available for things like irrigation that's necessary for agriculture. While conversely, the rivers up in the north almost always have a lot of water in them for irrigation because they're fed by the world's third largest system of glaciers that aren't dependent on the erratic winds of the weather. While there are locations of high agricultural productivity in the south of India, they're more limited in area and scattered apart from each other in stone. There you go. This is the uh, pro I'm probably thinking of when I'm thinking of all those, you know, tea... Uh, farms or whatever it's just greenery all the way it's probably this but this area is really bad apparently holy shit our contrast to the huge continuous piece of farmland across the north of india and this is in unknown in the state it's mostly a desert right thar desert it's known but it's kutch is mostly you know deserty i guess as soon as you start here and thus, this is why you also have smaller and more scattered concentrations of high population density across the southern section of India beneath the line in places like Mumbai, Hyderabad, and Bangalore. But not large stretches of continuously high density like you see in the north. That's but ridiculous. it's not like the population of India beneath this line is low. There's still more than 700 million... Okay. I didn't know that, but I also knew because of the elections that Uttar Pradesh is pretty important because of the people, how many people are there. So I knew that. I know I forgot that. But I didn't know that, that you know, it's going to be case with the entire states around it as well. And it had 50% of the population of India. I mean, that is, if I tell anyone that I know, I'm pretty sure everybody's going to be surprised because nobody thinks of it that way. Mostly because India is mostly dense. So nobody think of which place is more populous and everywhere is more populous. Right? Even the 50% below the, that, that, what, 700 million? That's still a lot, right? But, you know, another seven to 800 million just densely packed in the small area, right? That's just like, yeah, that's a heavy. But yeah, Bihar, you know, Uttar Pradesh always knew that these are important places for political things because of the people. And people who live there, which is about the entire population of Europe. It's still pretty densely populated at about the same scale as Germany all throughout it. It's just that the overall density to the north above the line in places like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar is just absolutely insane, and the yeah. most crowded stretch of land anywhere in the world. And with what's Holy arguably shit. the most productive piece of farmland anywhere in the world, it's really no wonder why. Yeah. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably intensely curious about why our world works. Yeah, people, go to brilliant.org, process real life floor, and support this channel. This is one of the key channels, right? That, that is on YouTube. This, not just key, this is the, I think, only channel that you should look for general knowledge type of videos, right? I mean, sure, he covers war and historical stuff as well. But even those war and historical stuff are usually based around general knowledge type of element. He doesn't talk about, you know, how kings and generals are making videos about it, like, you know, how the battle is going or something. He talks about, you know, core general knowledge and news type of thing. 
So this channel is really good. I've been reacting to this from the start, I guess. I don't know. You know start of my channel, but I don't remember exactly. Or was it in the middle? But yeah. But Real Life Lore has been really good. Lots of videos I've seen of him. You know, the, the lots of my general knowledge has expanded because of this channel. Right? So if nothing come out of my reaction channel, at least one thing will come out of my reaction channel is that my knowledge is really grew. Right? In history and general knowledge. But yeah. Well, well, that was why 50% of Indians live north of this line. I'm an Indian, yeah, I didn't even know that. But yeah, I guess there's more things I can tell other people that I know and they don't. But yeah, I guess I'll see you next time.